What is up, people? I know you saw the name of this lesson and were like, but wait, didn't we already learn about inflation unit two? Well, it turns out there's a little bit left of the story. Make sure to smash that like button and subscribe while the music plays. Famed economist Milton Friedman once said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. That very famous sentence is essentially the basis for this lesson and a very good distillation of how inflation occurs. When the money supply increases faster than output increases, we get inflation. And don't worry, we have an equation to support this, but more on that later. Okay, so let's go back to what we already know about the money supply and what happens when it increases and all that good stuff from unit four. We're going to use our money market and our ADAS models for this. Starting from long run equilibrium, let's see what happens when expansionary monetary policy is implemented. The money supply curve shifts to the right, reducing the nominal interest rate. This increases investment and consumer spending since borrowers like the lower interest rates, and this shifts the AD curve to the right. Okay, and this is where we stopped the story originally. So the first thing to point out is that an expansion of the money supply can increase real output in the short run. Keynesians care more about the short run, and so to them, this short run increase in real output justifies the policy. In fact, John Maynard Keynes once famously quipped, in the long run, we are all dead. The classical view and its more modern counterpart, monetarism, emphasizes the long run above all else. So let's keep going and see what happens eventually. On the ADAS model, we should know exactly how this ends. Nominal wages that were sticky in the short run become flexible and increase, causing the SRAS curve to shift to the left, bringing the economy back to long run equilibrium. Notice what's changed from the original equilibrium E1 to our new equilibrium at E3. This shows that when the economy is at full employment like it was at E1, changes in the money supply have no effect on real output in the long run. This is the idea of monetary neutrality that changes in the money supply only affect nominal variables, not real variables in the long run. We can go even a little bit further. The increase in the price level is proportional to the increase in the money supply. So if the money supply increased by 10%, in the long run, we'd expect the price level to rise by that same 10%. This is because the real quantity of money is unchanged. And yeah, that raises other questions. The real quantity of money is equal to the money supply divided by the price level. In other words, how much can that money actually buy? So if M and P both increase by the same proportion, there will be no change in the real quantity of money in the long run since our ratio of M over P is unchanged. And really everything we've talked about so far is based on the quantity theory of money, which emphasizes the positive relationship between the price level and the money supply, especially in the long run. Allow me to illustrate this mathematically with the velocity equation m times v equals p times y. Obviously, we need to start by defining our variables, though some of these should be familiar. m is for money supply, v represents the velocity of money, p is the price level, and we know that y is real GDP. Velocity of money is the only new concept here, and it refers to the number of times the average dollar bill is spent per year. Okay, so let's step back and look at what this equation, actually its identity, is trying to tell us. And to help us do that, I'm going to remind you of another equation, P times Y equals N, where N is nominal GDP. In other words, the price level times the real output gives us nominal GDP. But importantly for us now, once we realize that the right side of our equation is equal to nominal GDP, it means the left side, M times V, also equals nominal GDP. So the money supply times the number of times the average dollar bill is spent equals nominal GDP. And this should make sense because we know that nominal GDP is just a fancy way of saying total spending. So the amount of money multiplied by how many times that money gets spent equals total spending. Makes sense. By the way, we can also rewrite our equation to say that V equals N divided by M, which shows that the velocity of money is the ratio of nominal GDP to the money supply. Now remember the claim is that the growth of the money supply determines the growth of the price level. If we assume that the velocity of money is stable, then an increase in M leads to a proportional increase in nominal GDP. Now recall that changes in the money supply don't affect real GDP in the long run, and we're left with the realization that an increase in the money supply 
leads directly to a proportional increase in the price level. Here's an example. Again, assuming that V is constant, a 10% increase in M leads to a 10% increase in N. And since we know that a change in the money supply only affects nominal variables, this necessarily means that the entire 10% increase in N is the result of a 10% increase in P. This last part probably won't be on the test anymore, but monetarists like Milton Friedman argued that the central bank could achieve a 0% inflation rate by increasing the money supply in proportion to the increase in real GDP. For example, if real GDP rises at 3% and the money supply increases at 3%, if V is constant, then there will be no change in the price level. And this takes us back to his original point, that inflation is caused by increasing the money supply at a rate faster than output is growing. By the way, in case you're wondering, yes, everything we've just said about inflation is true of deflation, but in reverse. Deflation results from decreasing the money supply at too rapid a rate for a sustained period of time. And deflation can be awful too. Just ask anybody who lived through the Great Depression. The U.S. saw deflation of about 30% over a four-year period from 1929 to 1933. And as a result, the real burden of debts became crippling to farmers and to other borrowers. Then there's disinflation, which refers to the process of bringing down the inflation rate. We're going to use our brand new Phillips curve model to briefly explore this. Okay, so the LRPC represents the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, or the NERU. And the basic idea is that because actual inflation equals expected inflation, as long as policymakers don't do anything else, we'll stay right here at this inflation rate. But what if we think inflation is too high here? How do we bring the inflation rate down, aka introduce a policy of disinflation? Basically, the Fed will have to introduce contractionary policies, a very painful process that intentionally slows the economy down, possibly even causing a recession. This causes a downward movement along the SRPC to a combination of lower inflation and higher unemployment. In time, people adjust their inflationary expectations, now expecting a lower rate of inflation, shifting the SRPC to the left. And there it is, disinflation. The biggest challenge for a central bank, though, is convincing people to believe them when they institute disinflationary policies. If people believe that they'll stick with the contractionary policies, the disinflation process can actually occur pretty rapidly like it did in the 1980s. But if people don't trust them, it can be much tougher. All right, so that's it for this one. Until next time, this has been a Lamoney production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and to ring that bell. And check out the description for a link to the answers to the practice questions, as well as the unit notes and a great review book, Macro in 250 Words, I've written for you. And I will see you in the next video.